Hi everyone, my name is James. Welcome to King's Find Woodworking. Today I'm going to show you how to make a couple of real easy keepsake boxes. One is a miter spline box and the other is a dovetail key box. Both were made with the miter spline dovetail key jig that we recently made and there's a link in the description to see that video if you're interested. The sides for these boxes were actually just some pieces of maple that I had cut off specifically to show how the jig worked. And they ended up looking pretty nice. It was some nice looking wood, so I thought we would go ahead and complete the project and turn them into boxes. And my daughter Maya is the one who's gonna do the bulk of the work here. Once the pieces are in a manageable size, Maya has jointed one edge straight, and then she's gonna take them over to the table saw to rip the other edge parallel to that. We're actually just going to go ahead and build both boxes simultaneously in this video. It's actually a pretty easy process and both of these are, uh, you could probably knock out a pair of boxes like this in just one day if you've got the jig. It's real easy to do. Once we have the pieces to the right width, we want to take them over to the chop saw and cut them all to the right length, uh, or at least very close to the right length. We'll finish this up and get them exactly where they need to be on the table saw. With the table saw set at 45 degrees, we'll go ahead and cut one corner off. And then when we flip that board around and cut the other corner off, that'll make one perfect side. And unfortunately my blade is actually pretty dirty in this video, so we're getting quite a few burns. Uh, the burns don't really seem to make much difference when we're doing a glue up. Uh, they'll still bond pretty well. And these, of course, are going to be having splines or dovetail keys in them, so they're going to be strong. What we like to do is to set out some tape, uh, basically some painter's tape, to try to help align these joints before we glue them. Once they're all pressed in place nice and tight with the joints snug, we can put glue in each of these joints and spread it. All we need is actually a fairly thin layer here. We don't need too much. And Maya is going to rotate this up into place and roll it over to get all the joints to fit nicely. And the tape is in place there to keep those corner seams nice and tight so we don't develop any gaps during this first part of the process. Once we have everything taped, we like to clamp it down. If you have really nice, tight, snug tape, you could possibly use that as a clamp. I don't really think that's quite adequate, so even though we use the tape to align and to help us put it in position easy, we typically go ahead and clamp all of the corners anyhow. This also allows you to put pressure just exactly where you need it to tweak it and make the joints absolutely perfect. With that one done, we'll set it aside to let the glue dry and we will go ahead and clamp up the other one. With the glue set and clamps removed, I want to mark locations for where I'm going to put the splines. I've decided this is going to be the box with splines and the other one, which had a little bit prettier grain, is going to be the box for the dovetail keys. This is really just a visual measurement, what I think looks aesthetically pleasing. You could put them in different locations. Uh, you could put more splines, less splines. It's just entirely up to you. And the pencil marks on the box will help me line this up on the miter spline jig. You can see I have a kerf drawn there where the blade path is and I'll just line up that pencil mark in the middle. I'll slide my stop block right over to the box at that point. And now when I slide the box down, I know it's gonna cut right through the middle of that spot that I've marked. Next, we're gonna set the blade depth. Uh, well, I tend to go about three quarters or seven eighths of the way through the wood. We wouldn't want to go all the way through it because then of course the, uh, the spine will poke through on the inside. But we get pretty close. I usually get to somewhere between an eighth and a sixteenth of an inch away uh, from the edge. And then we'll just go ahead and proceed to cut the spline. Once it's cut there, we'll just rotate the box forward 90 degrees and cut the next spline. You can see how that's cut there, cut right through the center of our pencil mark.
And we'll just continue in this fashion until I have all of the cuts done on this side. Okay, so when I'm cutting the very last spline on this side, I'm actually going to pull the box out. I don't know if you can see it, but I flipped it over 180 degrees and now I am cutting the other side. And then I'll roll through a complete cycle of cuts on this side and that'll give me my top and bottom cuts. And this also makes sure that my top and bottom are the same distance away from each edge. With that complete, I will need to readjust my stop block again. I'll have to shift that a little bit to the right. Now I want to line up my pencil mark with the middle of the kerf again. Bring my stop block back till it touches, lock it down, and now we're all set to cut the middle series of kerfs. If you like our videos, it would be great if you could hit that subscribe button down below, and if you click the bell, you'll get notified of any future videos that come out. That really helps our channel to grow, and we appreciate it. We really love doing videos for YouTube. I would like to say thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. We take a lot of our requests uh, for what we build directly from what our Patreon supporters would like to see. And this combination jig that cuts both miter splines and dovetail keys was one of those suggestions. Alright, now that all of these slots are cut for the splines, Maya is going to take over and use some purple heart and she is going to cut some slices off of this to make those splines with. We like to be safe when cutting really little pieces like this, so I'll typically have a push block that I can cut into the bottom on. And here we've got the blade raised just about a 64th of an inch above the surface of the wood. So it's completely trapped underneath there and contained. So I've got a few of these cut and I did do a test fit. They're all a tiny bit big, which is fine. This will give me an opportunity to sand off some of these burn and burnish marks and get them down to where they have a nice snug fit inside of the slots. Now I'll just take a piece, get it to fit there. I made a mark on the right side that I'm going to slide it over and mark the left. So when I end up cutting this out, it's going to be just a little bit bigger than what I need for that spline. And if you see here, I've got it, when I put it upside down there, I'll also slide it over again and make another mark at the top. So my next piece will be a little bit bigger still. And I can continue in this fashion to maximize the number of splines that I'll get out of each piece and kind of minimize my waste. And you can cut them all at once if you can hold them down securely and carefully. Uh, and if not, you can just cut them one at a time. The next step is just to go ahead and glue them in. So I like to put glue on both sides of the spline and I'll try to get a little bit inside of that, uh, the kerf cut, the slot. It's not real easy, but if I get a little in there, that's gonna be fine. I can just proceed in this fashion until I have all of the splines in place and then we'll set this aside to dry. Once it has dried, I'll just take a dovetail saw or if you have a flush cut saw, you can use that and we'll cut these off. And I don't, I don't like to cut them off flush. I like to cut them just a little bit big and then sand them down to flush. And for that, I'm actually gonna clamp it onto the surface of my table and I'll use a random orbit sander with some fairly aggressive paper. I think I have 100 grit in here and that'll get down through this pretty fast. Once all four sides have been sanded, you can see the problem that I have created for myself. The wood that I chose for my spline wasn't wide enough, and so it doesn't come all the way to the edge of my kerf cut, the spline slot. And that's not a big deal. Uh, what I decided to do is just take some sandpaper, put it on a sanding pad here, and basically sand a chamfer or a bevel on this side of the box, and that'll bring it down to the surface or the edge of the purple heart, so it'll kind of look like I meant to do that. With that box done, I'm going to turn my attention over to the dovetail key box. So the box is basically the same size, and I think I'm going to put two dovetail keys in here. And I'm just kind of measuring to make sure that I like the location of those. And then we'll do the same exact technique. We're going to set it up uh, so that it's centered on our line there in the jig. And then we'll slide the stop block over to the edge of that 
and clamp it down. So Maya is doing this one and we're starting this one from the left side, just kind of a different perspective. We could have started it from the left or the right. It really wouldn't make any difference um, how, where we started it anyway. However, there is one difference. I'm going to put a stop block on both sides of this. The dovetail cutter is just a little more violent uh, than the uh, cutting a kerf with the table saw. And so I'd like to have that uh, uh, board in there or the box in there nice and secure so it doesn't bounce around or move around at all. I'll make sure it's snug, but I'll make sure it has a good fit as well. So we did do a few test cuts, uh, checking various heights of the dovetail cutter until we found a height that we thought was pleasing. And then we cut the box after that. You do have the same concern here too though. You don't want the dovetail cutter to be so high that it appears on the inside of the box. So you want it somewhere short of that. And you can hear in the background, I do have a compressor, some compressed air I'm blowing in the area, mostly to keep that sawdust out of the way so that we can see the cut as it's happening. It just makes it a little bit better for uh, video. The sawdust kept shooting directly at the camera and it was difficult to get a shot of what we were doing. The technique here was just the same as the miter spline. One side was cut, then the box was flipped over and the other side was cut. That makes the dovetail keys equidistant from each edge. And that's what they all look like until we get the dovetail keys put in. For cutting the dovetail keys, I have lowered the dovetail cutter so that the entire cutting surface of the cutter is just above the top of my router. Now this is actually taller than I really need it to be, but that's not a problem at all. I'll just simply make the dovetail a little bit wider and it will still fit. And we had to do a couple of test cuts with some different widths. So we had to adjust the fence in and out a couple of times until we have it dialed in and we get a cutter, uh, we get the width exactly right so that this key fits in. I think we did two trials and on the third one we just, we tapped it a little bit each time and on the third one it happened to fit perfectly. So you should never have to take more than maybe three, maybe four trials to get it dialed in. And our test fit looks pretty good. In fact, it should be a tiny bit loose so that when we get glue on there, it still fits. Next, we want to take it over to the table saw and we want to cut off the uh, that bit of dovetail at the bottom there. We can cut it a little wider than what we actually need. It's no big deal. We're going to trim the excess off anyway once the glue is dried on it. I end up cutting some a little wider and some a little narrower, so some have that T-shape on the top and some don't. This is one that we ended up cutting just a little bit narrower. And we're doing a test fit here, or Maya is actually doing a test fit here. And they're a little finicky, they're a little hard to get them started, even though they fit. So you do have to wiggle around just a little bit to get it to slide in nicely. And so she's going to mark it so we can cut it, but we don't want to mark it right at the box we want it to be wider so she cut it a little bit wider so we have some excess for safety and these are pretty simple to just cut off on the bandsaw if you don't have a bandsaw that's okay you can cut them off with a, a back saw a little hand saw once again it will be the same procedure on this box we're going to glue up and insert all of the dovetail keys and then we'll let those sit up and dry before we continue Now we'll go ahead and cut off the majority of this dovetail key that is sticking out using the same method that we did for the miter spline. Once again, I do like to cut them just slightly big so it doesn't cut up or scuff up the box much. And then I can just sand them down to be flush with the box. I always start with a pretty aggressive paper to get going. If there's a lot of uh, wood sticking out or if it's very hard, I'll start with 80 grit. Otherwise, I'll start with 100, and that just gets everything down to flush really fast. And then I'll work my way up to about 150 or 180 and quit there, and uh, leave it at that point and wait for final sanding. 
using a little bit of denatured alcohol on a rag here to get all the dust off and take a look at the grain. And this also helps me see if there are any scratches that I need to take out before I can proceed to final sanding. And this Pacific Coast Quilted Maple really pops. That's going to look like a pretty spectacular box, I think. And in case you were wondering, the dovetail keys for that are mahogany. We will also be making the top and the bottom out of mahogany. I put the stock together and cut it to rough size for the top and bottom of both boxes, the mahogany and the purple heart, and I'm giving this to Maya. She's going to joint one edge and get it cut down to size for us. The tops were just a little bit thicker than what we wanted, and I think the bottoms were too, so we sent them on a quick pass through the planer. And there they are. Those will be the tops and the bottoms for the two boxes. Next, Maya is going to rabbit a groove in the bottom inside of both boxes to accept the bottom. This is a 3 8 inch rabbiting bit with a bearing set up in a router table. It's a very easy cut to make and we just set it up to make a couple of passes or even maybe three passes to get it down to the depth that we want. And that's what it looks like. We have two options here. We can chisel those rounded corners square or we can do this which I like to do and we can trace the bottom to be round so that the bottom will fit into the box without us having to chisel the bottom part of the box square. You can sort of see the outline there with the radius corners for where the bottom of the box is going to be. We'll cut that on the bandsaw and then sand it down till it fits perfectly. Next step will be to go ahead and glue it into the box. Now my wood here is pretty stable at about 8 or 9% and I have thinned down this purple heart. Uh, in fact, it's actually going to be thinner than this when it's all done. And so if it does expand and contract a little bit, it's basically not going to have the strength to break the box open, especially with the miter splines. So in this situation, I do not account for moisture movement. Now, we've never had a problem when we do small uh, recessed bottoms that go inside. And you can see how much is actually sticking out. So we only used about half of that thickness. And we'll end up actually cutting this part off on the bandsaw. So we're going to clamp it down and let that set up overnight and we'll move to the other box, the one with the mahogany bottom, and just repeat the same procedure there. Once the glue is set up, we'll unclamp it and then we'll need to take this over to the bandsaw to cut the bottom off. It actually would have been smarter for us to go ahead and continue planing that down, but we weren't sure exactly how thick we wanted the bottom at the time, so we stopped a little prematurely. It's not really a big deal, as you can see. We'll actually be able to bandsaw the bottom off pretty easily. And then we have this cool little purple heart square that we got to find something to do with. Once those are done, the bandsaw leaves the cuts a little bit rough, so we'll just take this over to the disc sander, uh, or Maya is actually doing this here, and she's just going to smooth it up and get rid of all those rough cuts that the bandsaw made.
So that leaves a pretty good finish. Of course, it's not really quite smooth enough, and the sander here actually did leave some scratch marks, but it only took about a minute to do. Not a big deal. We'll take those scratch marks out with the random orbit sander. So you get a good close-up look at the bottom here with the rounded radius corners, which I kind of like. Uh, some people don't like it at all. Some people would prefer square corners, but that's a choice you can make when you build the box. Do it however you like. Now Maya is going to fit it for the lid. We have cut the board for the lid just about a sixteenth of an inch wide, so it's only going to stick out about a 32nd on each of the two sides and she'll leave it a 32nd on the back and you can see she's tracing it here just slightly wider than what it needs to be as well and we can just cut this on the chop saw it doesn't have to be perfect because once again we're just going to sand this down to flush once it's all done Same thing, of course, with the lid for the Purple Heart box, and we wanted that one to be just a little bit thinner. That box has a slightly different style to it. Now here's a really important step. We need the top of this box to be perfectly flat. So we spent about 10 minutes sanding the box perfectly flat on this big sanding block that we made. That way when the lid goes on it, it fits nice and tight and flush all the way around. The sanding block is pretty simple. It's just a piece of plywood, and ours is melamine in this case, with four sheets of sandpaper that have been attached to it with a spray adhesive. This really helps build boxes like this, helps you sand the tops and bottoms down flat and the joints between the lid and the main box as well. Once we're satisfied with the fit of both of those, we can go ahead and glue on the lids. I wanted to mention one more time that if you are interested in making this miter spline jig, I have a very detailed comprehensive video of exactly how to do it, and I'm going to put a link to that video in the description below. It's a really simple project and it takes less than a day to do. When Maya is gluing these lids on, she's making sure that she makes the uh, top of the lid stick out from all four sides. We want to be able to sand that down to flush. We don't want the lid to be too far set in on any one side. So we cut the lid about a sixteenth big total, and it should be sticking out about a thirty-second of an inch all the way around. Now this whole style of building is actually really easy to do. Hardly anything has had to be measured accurately. Most everything, we just put it up to the next piece, fitted it, uh, drew a line, cut it, glued it on a little bit big, and then sanded it off or sanded it down to flush. Building like this is fun, it's easy, it's fast, and there's very little chance for errors. And it's kind of deceptive to people who see it. It looks like you did a fantastic job at building. Uh, all of your joints fit absolutely perfectly, and it seems like uh, you're an excellent woodworker when you don't necessarily have to be. These are great beginner projects. Now we want to add some decoration to the lid. This is going to be some accent to make the box look really nice. The first thing we thought about when doing the mahogany box was we were going to have a stepped portion in the middle of the lid, kind of like what you're seeing here, and where there, it was raised up just a little bit from the mitered angles, but when we got to looking at it, we didn't like it like that so much. So we went ahead and raised the blade a little bit further and sliced a little bit more off and got kind of a more even uniform, like a barrel or a chest lid looking to, uh, shape for the top. So we just kind of modified it, you know, part way through the game. We didn't really have a game plan actually going in. We just kind of built it to what we thought looked nice, and, and I think this is what we settled on. I think we, we chose right here. I think projects like this are some of the funnest things to do in the wood shop. You just kind of go out there with an idea in your head. You don't necessarily make a plan, 
and you can just sort of modify the project as you go. And sometimes it doesn't turn out perfect, but more often than not, you end up with something that looks really nice. So for the Purple Heart box, we decided to go ahead and cut off all four corners and see what that looked like. And as you can see, my horribly dirty blade that was also dull at the time burned the Purple Heart terribly. Obviously, that's going to need a lot of sanding, but I do like the shape. Maya decided she wanted to add a little chamfer to the ends of the box, and I think that was a good choice too. Fortunately, mahogany is one of those woods that sands very easily. With the box bodies essentially done, the next step is to go ahead and cut the lid off. So we're taking it back over to the bandsaw, and you could do this with a table saw as well. You'll just raise your blade high enough to get through one wall of the box and then rotate the box four times and cut it off that way. If you happen to have a bandsaw, you can go ahead and cut the whole thing off with one straight pass. And after some copious sanding on the Purple Heart box, which Maya made me do because I let the blade go bad, uh, the lid looks great finally. All the burns are gone. And we did the same thing here. We're just going to cut this off with the bandsaw. Then it's very important to get back over to our sanding block because the bandsaw left the edges sort of rough. And we need these two to fit perfectly, the box lid and the box bottom. So Sai is helping us out there. We need the two of these to fit perfectly, so it hardly looks like there's a seam there. And the easiest way to do it is with the big sanding block. So Sai is checking it, she's seeing where it's still rough, and if it's still rough there, then it's just going to require some more sanding to get it down to where it needs to be. And we'll do the same thing with the lids, and then we'll get a perfect fit on those. With that done, Maya has taped down the hinges to where we want them to go. And so she can drill them. She's drilling them with a Vix bit, which is a self-centering bit, which puts the hole for the screw in the dead center. These hinges had to be taped down because they're sort of hollow underneath and they couldn't be glued temporarily with CA. So next, she's going to take and put a little bit of wax on the brass screws. That way the brass screws go in easily. We don't want to take a chance on them breaking. That would be a nightmare to try to fix that. She's going to put these in, but she's not going to fully sink them. They're going to be sunk by hand with a screwdriver so we don't break them. So she'll get them nearly all the way in with the gun and then finish it up with the screwdriver. After that's done and they're all put in, she'll take the hardware back off and then it's time to do some finish sanding. Typically, we'll finish these to 220 or 320 grit, somewhere in that range. One thing that is probably worth pointing out is a lot of people who just begin woodworking are kind of surprised by the amount of sanding that's actually required. And when you leave your projects with burn marks on them, somehow they tend to look homemade. It's really important to take the time to sand everything perfectly and no matter how difficult it is get all the burn marks out. With the sanding done it's time to put the finish. We've cleaned off the sawdust and we are going to use deft uh, semi-gloss clear lacquer to finish this with. And that Pacific Coast maple really pops with that finish. I think it looks really good. When you're spraying, it's important to start your spray outside of the box, spray all the way across, and then don't stop the spray until you get past it on the other side. That sort of gives you nice, uniform, even coverage. You'll be able to see that real obviously here when Maya's spraying this one. She's starting outside, spraying past it, and she's repeating that cycle, and each row is kind of overspraying the previous row. 
and she'll do the same thing for the lid. After three coats of lacquer, we usually take 1500 or 2000 grit sandpaper and just go over the surface of the lacquer very lightly. This takes off any very tiny little bumps or burrs that are on the surface and leaves us with a finish that feels glass smooth. These boxes are actually turning out pretty good. It was really just some wood that I was trying to put together to demonstrate the jig with. So I'm kind of glad that Maya suggested we go ahead and finish the boxes instead of just leaving them as four walls to show how the jig worked. So with this one being so pretty, we decided we're going to put a little bit of extra brass hardware into it. We're going to put a small foot into the bottom and we'll put a little uh, handle on the lid to open it. So she's putting holes at each of the four corners for the feet and before she put the feet in she scuffed up the edges of the brass on the feet with some 80 grit sandpaper. That'll help it get a good bite when the glue holds and a little bit of CA glue into the corner will hold the foot permanently in place. And that was a little bit too much CA glue there. Uh, I think perhaps that's just in our DNA. I think we, uh, we use too much glue no matter what we do. Oh, those little brass feet dressed it up really nice, and they're not too expensive either. Next, she is marking a location to put the handle uh, for the lid lift. And just a little dab of CA glue and this just screws right into place. And finally it's time to go ahead and reattach all of the hardware. Once again we'll use a little bit of wax on each of the brass screws so they don't break when they go in. After a final check to make sure the box lid is staying square to the body, she's going to go ahead and tighten it down. And that is going to complete the project for these two little keepsake boxes. Thanks for watching.